This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. A stunning abrupt climate shift is possible. During the last ice age, temperatures in Greenland heated up anywhere from 5 to 16 degrees Celsius in decades. That is up to 28 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. The Arctic is already warming beyond anything seen by modern humans. And last year, Arctic sea ice levels, well, they were the second lowest ever recorded. Are we rushing toward that tipping point now? Our guest is Dr. Sune Olander Rasmussen, Distinguished Associate Professor at the Center for Ice and Climate in Denmark's Niels Bohr Institute. He's co-author of the new paper published in Nature Communications April 8, 2021, The Anatomy of Past Abrupt Warmings Recorded in Greenland Ice. From Copenhagen, from Copenhagen Denmark, Sune, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much for having me. Well, before we get to the causes of such big changes, which we all want to know, what would one of these abrupt climate shifts around Greenland and the North Atlantic look like? That's a, that's a pretty good question that a lot of people are working on. Um, first of all, uh, these shifts happen from, a, from the full glacial state. So we're starting off from a, a point which is uh, massively colder than today. Uh, so we're in the in the central central part of the glacial period where uh, large parts of uh, North America and Canada and Scandinavia, Scandinavia were covered but with ice sheets, and then um, we see a uh, an abrupt climate change which happens in sometimes a few decades, even maybe less than that, up to a century or two, uh, during which uh, a number of features of the climate system change uh, more or less together. The sea ice changed uh, very uh, dramatically from a state where there was sea ice uh, far into the North Atlantic. Um, we had temperature changes, as you said, from, from uh, 5 to, to 16 degrees. Um, and um, we had a change in circulation pattern. Um, all happening um, together, um, this is what the paper is investigating, is how these, these different uh, factors of climate uh, how they change and how they they, uh, they relate to each other. And in the timeline in your new paper, we see sudden variations of Greenland temperatures in the period between 30 and 50,000 years ago. And we have not had such a rapid shift in the Arctic during the last 10,000 years. Do we know why the climate has been so stable? And are we due for a big Greenland warming anyway? I mean, this is a, this is what we what everybody wants to know, uh, and it's, it's we can't really uh, answer that question yet. This is a study that that helps us understand the the nature of these climate shifts, the mechanisms involved, um, and uh, hopefully uh, this will help us be able to predict or not, not maybe, maybe not predict, but uh, evaluate the risk of us going into a similar situation. Again, similar in the sense that we're we're not in a glacial now, so we can't have the same type of climate change that we had in the past. Well, we can still have an, an abrupt climate change which involves some of the same mechanisms. So changes in, in circulation patterns, in sea ice, um, in temperature. Um, so, so this is what we're worried about. This is why we, apart from just being curious, this is why we're so interested in these past climate changes because there are, um, there are many of them. There are about 30, depending on how you count them, uh, during the glacial. They were most pr pronounced and most regular during the during the central part of the of the glacial from from sixty to thirty thousand years ago, uh, but we have enough of them to be able to kind of study them and say, is there uh, a typical pattern? Is it, because often we only have a few instances of climate change, and it's very hard to derive the, the general picture from just a few cases. And what we set out to do here was to say, okay, can we analyze these repeated climate changes and find out whether there is kind of a fingerprint, and that fingerprint would then um, serve as a kind of a, as a warning sign if we see the same fingerprint today. Um, so, so that's what we set out to do. What, what we then found was that the climate changes, even though they, it's the same parameters that change, the order when you look at the really fine details, the order of when these different parts of the climate system changed is different from time to time. They all change from one from one level to another. Uh, but they do it in slightly different ways. And this leads us to conclude that, that, that most likely these processes are so closely entangled that if one of them changes, 
the rest of them change too. And that is worrying also in a modern climate um, scenario because, as you say, climate, uh, sea ice is changing today. Sea ice has been changing over the last decades. And this is one of the factors that changed in the past. And we're yet not able to say if this, this means that it can set up a similar, a similar set of events in the, in the future. But, but uh, it's definitely a step in understanding the mechanisms behind it. Well, this is one of the frustrating things a little about your paper, and must have been for you as scientists, is that the human mind wants a nice linear progression. Well, the sea ice goes out, and then the ocean currents weaken, and then this happens, and then that happens. But here we find something more like instruments in an orchestra playing in concert, and, and uh, they apparently can come up in, in, in different order. Yeah, that is, I mean, we, as I said, we set out to find the, the archetypical um, climate change in terms of, you know, uh, we use the analogy of, of dominoes, you know, so which, which, which pieces are involved and in which order do they, do they, do they uh, topple over and, so, and which dominoes will topple over which. So like, like the idea of there being a trigger, uh, the first domino that started to, to tip and then the rest would, would follow suit. And what we found was that it, you know, it's the same dominoes every time, but they're lined up in a, probably in a little bit different way every time. So it's not the same one that starts to, to topple. They all, eventually they all fall. And, uh, and this is where the domino, um, the domino analogy breaks down because every time before the first one has fallen all the way down and it's on the table, all the other ones have started falling too. So it's not that one sets off everything, and then once that, that is completed, something else happens. It's different which one starts, but they all change together. And this is what, in a way, is both very intriguing and also a little bit worrying because it, it, it indicates that the processes are so closely intertwined or, or entangled that you can't change one without the others. So when temperatures around Greenland shot up around 12 degrees C or more, about 21 degrees Fahrenheit, was that an isolated regional event or did it affect weather and climate around the world? I believe you co-authored a paper about that last year in the journal Science. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 are, several, there are many types of climate change, but, and, and, and this, it's pretty important to, to understand that this is these Dansker events, as they're called, these abrupt climate changes in Greenland, they are related to a change in the distribution of heat around the globe, more than a change of the mean temperature. So when Greenland gets a lot of, a lot of, uh, of uh, warm air, then that heat is being transported from somewhere else. Uh, it also changes very, on a much smaller scale, the, the average temperature on Earth. But, the, but, but, but the, the regional impact is much, much bigger than the global impact. So while Greenland, when Greenland sets, it goes into one of these uh, warm phases, uh, Antarctica starts to cool very slowly. Uh, and as long as Greenland is in, in the warm phase, heat is being tapped away from, from, uh, from, the, from the southern hemisphere. And Antarctica, where we have also had ice cores, we can do similar analysis, is slowly cooling. So, so, so uh, we call it the bipolar seesaw because it's uh, the two, two ends of, this, of, this, of the seesaw. So, so we can't we can't really compare this with global warming, or we can also not compare it with the deglaciation when Earth went from deep freeze into to the current into glacial, because this was was say more or less a globally homogeneous uh, change. Not that everybody saw the same change, but the direction was roughly the same everywhere. Uh, in these climate changes, here heat is being moved around in on Earth in a different way than it used to be. So it's, it's more like a, a conveyor belt kind of change than it is an, a change in the absolute heat of the, of the Earth. Still, one could only fear what the effects on uh, fish and on agriculture and on living species of all kinds might be when their regional climates go through big changes within a couple of decades. You can't evolve fast enough to deal with that. Exactly, exactly. And this is, this is I mean... Uh, on, a, on a broader picture, this is this is something that, that I think worries me and a lot of other climate researchers is that we tend to talk about global climate change, but nobody lives in the global climate. We all live in, in local climates, and and the effect of global climate change is very likely that some regions will experience 
much stronger and more abrupt climate changes than the than the global average, and and the people living in those regions will have to to adapt or move, um, and and those adaptations can be hard to do because change can be can be relatively strong compared to to the these we see these curves from the IPCC or from other from other efforts to do um, uh, you know the best the best projections we can of what's going to happen in the future. These curves are always very smooth. And we, we tend to discuss the amplitude of these. You know, do, we, do we want to invest heavily in, in measures that can reduce the warming so we stay below one and a half or two degrees or, you know, whatever target. It, it, it's always, you know, it's a smooth curve that we want to, to keep below a certain cap. But, but if we get anything like the changes we saw in the past, um, then the local changes or the regional changes are going to be a lot uh, bigger than that. And, uh, and it doesn't help you much if you live in an area that suddenly gets much, much warmer that somebody else is, you know, is having a cooler time. So it's not always the average that, that, that matters. And, and these changes were very abrupt. And even though we don't think we will get exactly the same because these were from a glacial state to begin with, we can still worry that the same mechanisms can, can induce climate change, which is uh, strong enough and, and abrupt enough to really be a problem. And we don't really, that, that's the whole problem about, about climate change. It's extremely hard to predict. We don't even talk about prediction. We, t- we talk about, you know, if, if we're really good, we may get to a point where we can assess the risk. Not say when it will happen, but just say what the risk of it happening within a certain time frame would be. That would in itself be a, uh, a big step forward. And this is what we're working working on, and, uh, and I sometimes think this agenda gets gets uh, tucked away a little bit in the back compared to the argument about you know keeping average temperature or average climate change below a certain threshold because it, the, the local regional impact can be a lot stronger than that. Well, I totally agree with you. Now, what are the factors that you did look at? I mean, we have Arctic. Uh, sea ice, we have global temperatures. So what were the dominoes, so to speak? Yeah, you can say, I mean, we, we, are, we rely on what's called proxy data because we can't measure past temperatures directly. So we, we, we rely on what we can measure in ice cores with, uh, and then uh, we can, can transfer that or to something we really want to know. So this is why it's called proxy data. Uh, and so in terms of temperature, we have isotopes of the, of the ice core that can tell us what the temperature was. We have uh, the calcium and the dust content of the of the ice core that tells us something about how efficient the atmosphere is at, at transporting impurities from Asia to Greenland. So it's related to the to the storminess uh, and uh, uh, of the atmosphere, and also to the amount of, of dust available, which will rely uh, mainly on on the, the wind and the dryness of the areas where the dust comes from. Then we have a sodium, which uh, at least to some degree tells us something about sea ice probably other factors too. Um, and um, so, so these are all, you know, all proxies um, that we can derive from the ice core. We also have the layer thickness, so, which will tell us simply how much snow fell in Greenland. Um, so these are all indirect measures. What we then did was to, to see if we could make sense of this, was to run a climate model that will produce you know, the, the, the direct observables that we're really interested in, and then compare how how the model version of the reality um, looked relative to our data. And that was a very good correspondence. So, so we think there's, a, there's some, uh, some um, you know, um, we have some backing in interpreting the data from the ice core the way we do. Well, some scientists have suggested that this uh, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, is the principal driver of changes on Greenland. But now this paper seems to cast some doubt on that. I wouldn't say that. It, what, what, what it, what I think it, 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 it adds a layer of into the to the explanation of why the AMOC is changing. Because some people tend to think that the AMOC triggers everything. Like the AMOC is in the driver's seat and then everything else follows. I don't think anybody is really suggesting that the AMOC does not play a big role in these climate changes. But whether it's the trigger is still an open question. It could also be that atmospheric changes or sea ice is helping tip the ocean currents, the AMOC, which then feeds back on the climate system. So in terms of what the trigger is, I think the jury is still out. 
if there is a trigger at all, you could also interpret our, our new results in the way that you don't need a trigger because it's the collective it's the collective action of all these parts of the climate system and the same ones every time that creates the, 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 the changes. And maybe, maybe if one starts to change, and that could just happen because it's because of, you know random random uh, when the, the, the system has been in a cold state for a while and there's some heat accumulating in subsurface ocean this heat will, will be buoyant and that some at some point breaks through and that influences sea ice but maybe a, a wind anomaly or sea ice anomaly can also initiate this this process once the system is close to to being able to tip so so it, it's a very i know it's a, it's very hairy but i would say that that, that in terms of, of understanding what what triggers these about ch- changes, we're, we're we're really advancing our knowledge these, these years. But it's it's still not clear whether a an outside external trigger is needed or whether it's the internal system, internal process in the system that just allows for a rapid change between cold state and a mild state, um, and that, it, that, that this hunt for it for a trigger is maybe elusive. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith from the University of Copenhagen. Our guest is Dr. Sune Olanda Rasmussen. We are talking about abrupt radical warming in the Arctic, which happened many times in the last 100,000 years. And could it come again? We don't know. So would you talk to us, please, about the appearance of time lags in this process of abrupt warming? And there's a reason why I ask you this. So a time lag between the different processes, or um... yes, are there time lags involved? Could something actually be happening even right now, but we're presently just stuck in the time lag, and we'll see it soon. Oh yeah, I mean you can see if you look at the different processes that that were that, that played into these past climate changes, they were they were lagging uh, by decades of each other, and they weren't always in the same order. So one process would start at one occasion, and then at the next occasion, about 30 of these, it would be something else that, that started, and the other, the other processes would follow suit. So there are time lags involved there. Then in this north-south communication that I mentioned uh, between the, the climate of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, there's also a time lag of, of uh, around 100 years before, before um, the changes make their way all the way to Antarctica. So the climate system is full of these uh, decadal scale uh, lags because you need maybe to to build you know if you when you start pulling heat up north you're taking it away from the southern ocean from the oceans the center of the oceans you need to build up a gradient you need to build up a difference before you can you can you can uh, this change will will uh, penetrate into for example an Antarctica it's very hard to get a signal to an Antarctica so this is where you get the biggest lag a hundred year lag. Because you need to get across the ocean and atmospheric uh, circulation patterns that that uh, circulate around Antarctica and, and makes Antarctica very ins- well insulated. So decade, decadal lags or even centennial lags are very common in the climate system, and, and there, yeah, we, we see that we see these, and they're also likely to to be relevant today. Well, soon I suppose we reach a tipping point where these various factors sway together towards a big change. How long would that take? Do we know? No, I don't think we know. I mean, the combination will be different from what we know from the past because we're starting from a, from a different setup. We're starting from an interglacial uh, warm state rather than a cold state. Um, but um, the processes, you know, in the past changed over over you know the fastest ones over a few decades, and we could definitely expect to see uh, that uh, that time scale involved. Um, but uh, there were also some of them that were, which were slower, so it, it's extremely hard to put a number to it. But but the decadal to centennial scale uh, changes, which doesn't sound like much in terms of abruptness when you compare to to a human lifetime, but when you compare to that to the to the factors that changed. Uh, that changed climate on a natural in the natural cycle before humans started to to interfere. Um, these are are very very abrupt. Well, yes, I mean it is possible that there could be a major change within a human lifetime, and that's pretty fast and pretty significant. It's fast enough, isn't it? It's fast enough. 
In a recent Radio Ecoshock interview, we had Johannes Lohmann, a young scientist from Niels Bohr, and he explained that the speed of climate change can bring tipping points sooner than most models suggest. So we are in uncharted territory here. Do you think human-induced climate change will make another abrupt Arctic warming more likely or happen sooner? Uh, more likely, definitely. Uh, and if it happens, then, you know, that kind of it gives you the question, this is the answer to the second question. If, you're, if, you're, if it happens and you've been increasing the, the risk, then it would also happen sooner, yes. Whether it happens is still, a, is still an open question. And I think if we talk about reasons why we should, we should try to, to, uh, to mitigate climate change, me, as, as a person, as a father of three, I'm a lot more worried about abrupt climate change than the gradual climate change. Not that I'm not worried about two or two and a half degrees in, in 100 years, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm very worried about the abrupt climate change because in a densely populated planet, abrupt climate change can, can have a very large regional impact. And if that region is heavily populated, that will cause um, you know, geopolitical implications uh, beyond what I would like to imagine. So I think reducing the risk of something like that is at least as good as an argument as, as uh, the argument for, for, for reducing the amplitude of the, of the projected climate change, the gradual climate change. So there, it's kind of two sides of the same thing because by reducing the, the, the slow, general, global uh, climate change, you're probably also reducing the risk of abrupt climate change. You can, uh, analogy would be if you're in a boat and you know that the boat can tip over. I mean, you don't, you're not starting to, to, to dance around, are you? I mean, you'd like to, to, to stay a little bit still. And the more you learn about your boat as being unstable, the more quiet you want to be. Um, and, and so, 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 so in, 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 with that analogy, I'd like us not to, to tip the boat, not to rock the boat too much. And, and one way to, to not rock the boat is to basically just, you know, try to get, to reduce the, the, the climate change of all sorts. Um, but, but in terms of what I'm most, most worried about as a, as a human being, it's definitely the consequence of about, about climate change rather than the gradual ones, which is bad enough. Um, but I think the abrupt ones, they're, they're so hard to imagine, and therefore, because we don't, we're only talking about risk assessment, it's, it's, it's really hard, to, and I don't want to say exactly what will happen because that would be pure speculation. But, it, but, uh, but looking, in the back, looking back at what, how ecosystems reacted when, when we had these abrupt climate changes in the past, it's, it's, you know, it's bad enough. Yes, these are not minor concerns. Look, I know that you don't want to predict, you know, what will happen because we don't know. But still, Denmark is a partner with the Greenlandic government. And we have to think that just on a very regional uh, effort, this change, should it happen, would affect Greenland hugely. And it would also probably change the weather in Northern Europe, uh, the UK, and even Denmark, wouldn't you think? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, and of course, it, you know, is it, a, is it a problem that weather changes? Is it climate change? You know, it depends a lot on the people who live in the areas. And, and when, this, when these changes happened, I don't know the number, but I've heard estimates of that the population in Europe was a like 100,000 people or so. You know, so, so and, and they were all migrants. Um, they were hunter gatherers and they would adapt and they would move around. Um, area, and you would have to move several hundred kilometers, uh, if not thousands in a lifetime to, to adapt to the changing conditions of when these about climate changes happened, which was, you know, if you ask the people back then, they would probably be uh, at least mildly annoyed, but they, but there was space enough and, and people hadn't settled and they hadn't, uh, you know, uh, built large, uh, large cities and infrastructure that was hard to bring with them. So, so I think it's really hard to use anything from the past as an analogy to how uh, things will look if we have a, a climate change in the, in, the, in, the, in the future. Not because I want to be, a, you know, no fear-mongering, but, but we, are a lot of, we are a lot of people on, on Earth now, and a lot of people rely on, on, their, on their livelihoods from areas which are very densely populated and very, de and very heavily farmed because conditions are good right there. And, and those areas could, could definitely experience serious change. What still needs to be done to understand these risks better? And, and what are you working on these days? 
Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a super, super interesting and hard question because uh, even though we have 30 of these, it's still a relatively small number uh, in terms of statistics. And, um, and, and they all come from a, from a different, as I said, they come from a different starting point as what we have today. So we're trying to understand this both in terms of getting our models to capture these, these uh, abrupt climate changes that the model we use for this study uh, does capture the ones in the past, and we're trying to figure out to what degree we can trust it in also capturing similar changes in the, in the future. Um, it's a big job, and it's, it's, it's super difficult because these models are extremely expensive to run in terms of computing time. So there's a limit to how, much, how many experiments you can make. But that's one, one line of, of, of work. Another line is more theoretical work in, in understanding how complex dynamical systems with lots of parts that, that, that uh, interact, how these systems change. Um, and, and there's some theory, um, as, as you talked with Johannes Lohmann uh, recently, he's a, an expert in that. So there are some, some general features in the behavior of these systems that you can derive um, and, and learn from. And then um, as a data person, of course, we, you know, we, we, go, we go back and try to find data from all parts of the world, world uh, speleothems, so you know, dripstones from, from caves, marine sediments, ice cores, try to get a, get a picture which is as, as um, comprehensive as possible with, a lot, with, with as good spatial coverage, geographical coverage, and temporal coverage as possible, and, and, and also try to get these records aligned so that we know not only what happened, but also you know, tease out the finer details in how, how the change is propagated. But it's not something that was, that's going to be done um, here at the end of the week. It's a long haul, uh, and it's, all, it's also always uh, already been going on for, for, for decades. But it is a climate system so immensely complex that, that this is uh, some, it's going to take some time. Well, it's amazing we can do it at all, that science can retrieve the memory of Earth long before humans ever set foot on it. Yeah, isn't it fantastic? It all comes back, you know, from a Copenhagen perspective, it all comes back to Professor Vyadanskart, who, who uh, will soon be, uh, you know, who would have been 100 years old soon, who came up with this idea that, that, uh, that isotopes capture the temperature of the past, and that you could go to the ice sheets and find all layers of accumulation. This is a, was a very, very good idea. Keeps us busy still today. Of course, we still we have lots more methods and lot, lot other, a lot of other types of measurements that we've added on. But the whole basic idea that the ice sheets capture in a very ordered and, and layered sense uh, the precipitation of the past, and then we can go back and retrieve this and still find layer by layer, year by year, how climate changed well into the glacial and and i think it's you know this is what keeps me going um i think it's it's an amazing thing that is possible and it keeps opening up new questions that you can answer perfect from the niels bohr institute at the university of copenhagen we've been speaking with geophysicist and carlsberg foundation distinguished associate professor sune olander rasmussen find links to the free access paper the anatomy of past abrupt warmings recorded in greenland ice in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Sune, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insight with us. Thank you very, very much for talking to me. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. There we go. Thank you. That was inspiring, and you really uh, have got me thinking again about our whole approach as far as the, uh, you know, the, the one or two degrees thing. I get the picture from you of hot air rushing from one part of the earth to another and, and drawing cold air somewhere else. It's, it's a very dynamic picture. It's probably more water than air, but apart from that, I think, you know, I think you're right. And, and it, it is a very dynamic picture. And, uh, and understanding this, uh, you know, we need to understand these processes in order to make you know, reasonable good forecasts and, and projections for the future, because they're likely not to be just an, an average response to this. So uh, this is, I think it's intriguing, and uh, we, we'll, we'll keep going at this, um, because this is, I think, uh, it's, it's super interesting, isn't it? You know? It is. Nothing in nature is average.